Thank you. Good morning to everybody. The title of my talk today is <coughs> Bio-based Monomers and Polymers, A Route to Sustainable Plastics? Question <laughs> mark. So uh, let's start uh, uh, reading a definition of sustainable development that was uh, issued some 25 years ago. And it says that development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So there is a concern towards uh, future generations. And what we can say is that among the many problems concerned with uh, uh, the intensive use of oil, there are uh, the problem of global warming, of the possibility of fossil resources depletion, one of the possibilities to help solving, not the only one of course, is to try to shift from oil-based feedstocks to renewable feedstocks. We will see at the end if this is something that makes sense or not. Uh, the most important uh, cycle in the biosphere is the carbon cycle, as we may know. And uh, above uh, ground level, let's say, uh, it is well balanced. However, uh, since men started uh, using fossil carbon that it took millions of years to be mobilized below ground level to produce chemicals, fuels, uh, polymers, uh, what happened is that we sent back this carbon, this ex-fossil carbon, to the atmosphere in the form of CO2 in a much, much shorter time frame. So there is a big, big imbalance of this kind of cycle. So the idea is to try to create a more, let's say, um, virtuous kind of cycle using, uh, uh, at least in part, in the applications where it is allowed, biomass instead of fossil carbon. Uh, the amount of biomass that is available uh, in our planet is very large, as you see on the left hand side. Oops. Uh, but uh, of this biomass, man only uses about 3.5%, and uh, of this 3.5%, it is mostly used for food, then you see there is a big share also of wood, energy, paper, etc. But a very, very small percentage for non-food use, especially for producing chemicals and polymers. If we want to produce uh, bio-based polymers, uh, we can follow three types of uh, roads. Either we go uh, directly by extracting polymers from agro-resources, or we can use uh, fermentation processes, microorganisms that uh, directly synthesize polymers, and we will see this is mainly the field of polyhydroxyalkanoids, polyesters, or we can use biotechnology to produce uh, building blocks or monomers that will be later synthesized into macromolecules via normal conventional synthesis. So I will start with the first uh, part, and I will talk a little bit about history. I mean, historically, there are polymers that have been exploited since many, many years, I would say centuries, and they are mostly cellulosics and natural rubber. The first plant uh, to use a cellulose and to transform it into, into rayon or into acetate cellulose dates back to the second half of the, or the end, let's say, of the 19th century, when in France the first um, plant for producing fibers was built. But if we think about natural rubber, we go even earlier. This is the first half of the 19th century, when the idea of Charles Goodyear of vulcanization of natural rubber, which is obtained from the tree Evea brasiliensis, I transformed it into a usable um, elastomeric material. Nowadays, only less than 50% is natural rubber. The rest of the rubber that is used comes from oil and natural gas. So this is something that has to do with uh, history. If you go to, to the present times uh, and we look, for example, at this uh, review paper that appeared this year, 
and it uh, talks about uh, current progress in biobased polymers and future trends. What you can see in the last 20 years, this is the time frame of these plots, both from the point of view of science, that is uh, the scientific interest, you see a, a almost exponential growth of uh, the number of papers published, but also from the industrial point of view, I mean patents uh, being issued, on this topic are increasing. It means that there is a lot, a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, before going into a description of the type of monomers and building blocks that are available nowadays, I would like to point out the concept of bio-based material. There has been rather a big confusion until ASTM issued a very clear standard test method to define the amount of bio-based content in any kind of material, solid, liquid, or gaseous material. And this is done by uh, evaluating the amount of carbon-14 or radiocarbon in the material. And the bio-based content is defined as the percentage by weight of the total carbon in the material that is of uh, organic origin, contains carbon-14. Fossil uh, carbon doesn't contain any appreciable amount of carbon-14. So we can have materials that are either totally fossil, 0% carbon-14 that is totally deriving from fossil carbon, 100% at the other extreme, totally bio-based material, and we can also estimate a given percentage of uh, biocarbon. This is important because up to a few years ago, there was a sort of uh, idea that a material either was totally fossil-based or totally bio-based. Now we understand that even a given percentage of uh, biocarbon in a material can be something useful. <clears throat> Let now uh, go to the... Uh, uh, to the production of bio-based polymers that uses fermentation processes. And let's start with the products that can be uh, obtained by direct fermentation. If we use biomass and we uh, use microbes to ferment it, we can obtain either the polymer, which will be, of course, 100% bio-based because it directly derives from the biomass, or we can obtain monomer or building blocks that we will use to chemically form macromolecules. Let's start with this uh, category. And as I already anticipated, that they are mostly the so-called bacterial polyesters. These are uh, polyesters that are produced naturally by microbes as a carbon and energy source, as we humans, uh, or, or and I mean vegetables, um, have uh, starch and humans have uh, the um, oh, uh, glycogen, which is a reserve material. And uh, uh, they um, store it as an endogenous source of carbon and energy in the form of little granules. Of course, via biotechnology, it is possible to increase the amount of uh, polymer uh, um, that is accumulated and it, it is possible to go even to a, more than 90% of the total weight of the cell, which is formed by the polyester. The normal polyester that is synthesized is a homopolymer, polyhydroxybutyrate. It is a crystalline polymer that melts around 170 and has a glass transition below room temperature. But this is not the only pHA that can be obtained. It is uh, known that there are some bacteria that are very good bioreactors for the synthesis of copolymers. That is, in addition to the normal 3-hydroxybutyrate monomer, they can introduce in the polymer chain during biosynthesis different types of monomers that depend on the type of substrate on which the bacteria are grown. So if we have copolymers, of course, we have a wide range of different properties depending on the type of unit that is introduced and on the concentration. So we can have uh, polymers that go from high modulus, rigid materials, all the way down to rubbery materials. 
Uh, now I show you a table. I don't know if you can read it from there, but uh, this is the first of several tables that I will show you. And we created this table getting all data from the web, the most recent ones. We updated it last week. And uh, uh, all data have to be taken with some caution because, of course, they come from what you find in the web. Sometimes you, you also find rather conflicting information. So we try to do our best to, to provide some information about the countries where polymers can be, are produced, the, the level, the status of their commercialization, and uh, the various informations about capacity of production. All this, as you see, um, there are several productions in uh, China, PRC. In the US, uh, it is well known that metabolics used to produce, they have a lot of patents in their hands, but they stopped the production in the US and now they have a joint venture in Spain with uh, this company. And they are expected to produce this kind of uh, amount of polymer. There is a curiosity. All of these companies produce, of course, via fermentation, as I said, but these new light technologies, we found that they claim that they produce without fermentation, but directly from greenhouse gas through a proprietary technology, uh, PHAs, but in a very small amount, 50 tons per year. This is just a curiosity. Let's now go to building blocks that can be obtained from biomass via fermentation and later on by chemical synthesis, you can obtain macromolecules. And I will start describing, I will divide this field because there are many monomers in two groups. The group of monomers that yield homopolymers and then I will go to building blocks. So monomers for uh, homopolymers, we are in this part of my previous scheme. Of course, I start with polylactic acid. Everybody knows polylactic acid. It can be produced directly from starch by fermentation in the form of the L monomer. The monomer can be chemically polymerized to a polymer. Of course, this polymer is 100% bio-based because the monomer is only one monomer and it derives directly from a bioresource. An important thing to stress is that this polymer has in its uh, repeating unit a chiral carbon that can be present in two configurations. The natural uh, monomer that is obtained by fermentation is the L monomer, as I already said. So if uh, uh, this monomer is homopolymerized, one obtains a polymer chain with a very high level of regu serial regularity and therefore it is able to crystallize. You have a polymer that melts around 170, similar to the PHB that I mentioned before, but here you have a glass transition which is higher than room temperature, 60 degrees. However, if during the polymerization which is run in the company, you introduce some D units, different amounts of the other chirality unit, you interrupt the regularity of the chain and you decrease the capability to crystallize. This is something that is known since a lot of uh, years. This, this is a very old publication where it is shown that the amount of crystal phase, heat of fusion, and the melting temperature decrease with increasing amount of this uh, foreign, let's say, D units. So the important message is that PLA, which is often believed as a single polymer, really is a large family of polymers with very different properties. Another curiosity concerning PLA is the possibility to form stereocomplexes. Stereocomplexes are complexes that are formed between one chain of homopoly L lactic acid and one chain with homopoly D lactic acid. They can combine into complexes that have the possibility to form a crystal phase that melts 50 degrees higher than the normal PLA, and this gives uh, the possibility to apply this kind of stereocomplex to high, more highly demanding kind of applications like in automotive, etc., where you need high melting temperatures. This is again a table that shows you the availability of a monomer and of the polymer. The monomer is uh, manufactured by companies uh, in, in uh, Europe also. Of course, uh, the, uh, in, uh, Nature Works manufactures not only the polymer but also the monomer. 
and uh, you have different types of, uh, I mean, you find uh, uh, production also in China, uh, quite a lot in, uh, in uh, Europe. And apart from this stereo complex that I already mentioned, BASF, for example, produces blends, Simbra uh, produces foamed materials, so there are several um, <coughs> forms of polyactic acid that are available uh, on the market. Uh, here only you see the, the mm, amount of, it is used mostly in packaging, quite a lot also in textiles, the fibers, biomedical fields and other kind of applications, but packaging, especially in Europe, is the most uh, broadly, uh, largest uh, field of application of PLA. Feedstocks, up to now, the feedstock uh, used is mostly uh, competing with the food production. The idea is that in future, uh, uh, the feedstock will go to um, something that does not compete with food, uh, that is essentially cellulosics. But I will go back to this point later on. Another monomer that uh, can yield to a homopolymer, can be homopolymerized, this is ethylene, bioethylene. In South America, especially where there is a lot of sugar cane production, there is the possibility to obtain ethanol uh, by uh, fermentation, and then by, the, by a dehydration, ethylene is obtained, and you can polymerize it to all kinds of polyethylene we know, high, low density, etc. The company interested in this business is Braskem. They are located in Brazil. They have a plant for 200 kilotons per year production. And they claim that each ton of green polyethylene removes 2.5 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. So they are very proud of their kind of production and of the environmentally friendly aspects. And not only Braskem, but there are many, many companies that are interested in this biopolyethylene business around the world. And I want to finish. The, uh, this is the last homopolymer that I will illustrate, which is an old one. This is nylon 11, polyamide 11, which is obtained by a polymerization, homopolymerization of 11 amino decanoic acid derived from castor oil. Polyamide 11 is an important polymer, it's a technopolymer with a number of applications and a very important market. And this is a real biopolymer. And of course, again, 100% biobased because the monomer is biobased. And now I want to go into the field of monomers that are uh, essentially building blocks to build macromolecules of very different kinds. They can be combined in different ways. And very often the polymers that you obtain are not 100% biobased, but can have a content, a given content of biobased carbon. Since we were talking about uh, nylons, I want to start with uh, monomers for nylons. So you can have uh, diamines or diacids that are biobased. For example, Katai is interested in 1,5-pentamethylene diamine monomer to substitute 1,6-hexamethylene uh, uh, diamine, which is used in nylon 6,6, 6, for example. And uh, a range of important companies, large companies, are interested in uh, sebacic acid, which is the C10, which is used in nylon 610, for example. So a diacid and a diamine that are totally biobased and can give a contribution of biobased carbon to nylons. And now we start with the other monomers. An important one is a diol. 1,3-propandiol. 1,3-propandiol can be synthesized in nature using two different microorganisms, <coughs> a yeast and a bacterium in a sequence. However, via genetic engineering, it was possible to modify Escherichia coli, which is a typical bacterium used in this kind of uh, work, and to have in a single step the transformation of glucose to 1,3-propandiol. Here you see, and you will see in several examples I will show you later on, that it is very often the cooperation between a company having to do 
with food or with <coughs> agricultural products that cooperates with a company expert in genetic engineering or in uh, enzymatic production, enzyme production, that uh, lead to uh, the obtainment of these uh, monomers. Uh, one three uh, <coughs> propandiol can be used, for example, so Dupont uses it to uh, obtain a polyester using uh, tereftalic acid. And this is a polyester that mimics, if you like, PET, but it has a three uh, carbon atom instead of a four, uh, of a two carbon atom glycol. And uh, this polyester can be used for fibers or for engineering plastics applications, etc. Another interesting monomer, the one we described is a glycol, this one is a diacid. We are talking about monomers that can be used for polyesters, of course. And this is uh, biosaccinic acid. Biosaccinic acid uh, is nowadays produced by bioamber starting from wheat, uh, an enzymatic process to glucose, and again a recombinant the E. coli to obtain the diacid. Bioamber has in France a very a production which is not very large, 3,000 tons per year, using a very large scale fermenter. And they are planning in conjunction with Mitsui to start producing next year in Ontario, in, in Canada, at a much larger um, level of production, this biosaccinic acid. Biosaccinic acid, of course, can be transformed in many different other monomers, including uh, one for butandiol that could be uh, used in the synthesis of polyester, which is PBS, polybutylene succinate, a very important polyester uh, that uh, can... Uh, here you have a table that shows you the production of the biosaccinic acid. As you see, commercial, we only have this one uh, up here. Uh, and uh, uh, something here. The one for uh, butandiol from biosaccinic acid is expected uh, sometime next year. And uh, um, there is Shovadenko that already produces the polymer biosaccinic acid, but only using biosaccinic acid, uh, sorry, PBS, polybutadine, uh, Oh God, B polybutylene succinate from biosaccinic acid. Uh, it, they do not use butandiol, biobutandiol up to now, but they plan to use it in the near future. And there is a very last uh, um, information coming from Tate and Lyle and Genomatica from San Diego, California, that, that they are building up uh, and that they want to go into commercial scale production of this 1,4-butandiol. So all these monomers will be available shortly, most probably, and uh, totally 100% based PBS will be available too. Another monomer that uh, may have a lot of applications is uh, bioacrylic acid. You, you know that uh, Acrylics are very important uh, polymers. And uh, bioacrylic acid can be obtained through a chemical downstream process, starting from a bio-based monomer, which is 3-hydroxypropionic acid, which can be produced starting from biomass through an enzymatic process and an engineered pathway. Again, you see the joint venture of an agricultural company and Novozymes, which is uh, uh, one of the leading companies in enzymes. Uh, when bioacrylic acid is obtained, it can be applied to, ma to the production of many different polymers in the form of fibers of superabsorbents. You know that superabsorbents uh, have an enormous uh, market. And the ASF very recently announced the intention to use 100% bio-based acrylic acid in their superabsorbent polymers. So this is another big field of application for bio-based uh, monomers and polymers. Now, of course, what about bio-PET? PET is a very important uh, packaging material. Uh, PET is made uh, by using a glycol that can be obtained, uh, ethylene glycol, from the bioethylene, if we like. But what about the tereftalic acid? 
terephthalic acid is commonly only oil-based, but there are many companies interested in the bio routes to terephthalic acid. Uh, there is this uh, Virent, which is interested in the obtainment by a proprietary uh, process from biomass uh, to arrive to aromatic complexes and uh, to paraxylene, and paraxylene then will be transformed into terephthalic acid. The idea is to start production in 2015 of paraxylene with a capacity which varies very much. They go from 30 to 220 kilotons per year. Uh, it will depend, I think, on the economical situation worldwide. Uh, not only Virent, but also Givo. Givo, uh, they want to produce paraxylene, not starting, uh, following a different route, and starting from isobutanol. They already have plants producing in slow, uh, low amounts, uh, they are pilot or so, in the US, um, the isobutanol, and uh, the idea is to go into commercial production of bioparaxylene next year, so rather shortly. Many other companies interested in this kind of business uh, following different kinds of routes. I cannot go into the details at all, but uh, you have a lot, uh, Nellotech uh, thinking to use uh, pyrolysis, Genomatic and Amiris from Muconic Acid, Sabic has a, a patent on the production from terpenes, limonin, and other kind of uh, processing methodologies to obtain tereftalic acid. And uh, there is still one other option, which is, uh, uh, in alternative to tereftalic acid, the use of furan dicarboxylic acid. In this business is the company Avancium, and uh, this uh, kind of uh, diacid has a five-membered ring instead of the six-membered ring of the tereftalic acid. They uh, plan to go into commercial production in 2015, and from their preliminary studies, they claim that a bottle made uh, uh, with polyethylene furanoate instead of polyethylene tereftalate, the barrier to oxygen and carbon dioxide is even better. So they are very interested in producing and promoting this kind of material. So this slide only summarizes what I said. You have uh, for tereftalic acid uh, the ethylene glycol bio-based uh, that amounts to 30% of PET and is already available, and the interest is from these companies. You have the bio-based reftalic acid, which amounts to 70% of PET resin that can be produced via all these routes we described, or can be substituted by the furan dicarboxylic acid. Uh, there is an, an, a very large interest, especially by the Coca-Cola companies, you may know, which invested a lot of money working with some of the companies we mentioned in order to obtain this totally 100% bio-based Coca-Cola bottle. Uh, we shift to other monomers, bio-based polyols. Bio-based polyols can be obtained from several uh, oil seeds, for example, from soy. Uh, seeds, and this is something that was uh, already thought uh, at the first half of last century by Henry Ford. He came from an agricultural family. They had uh, big fields uh, producing soy, and he thought that there was a great potential in marrying agriculture and industry using soy polyols to make resins. And they presented a demonst demonstration uh, car in 1941 called the soybean car, where some parts were made uh, with uh, soy-based resins. So polyols can be used to make resins in conjunction with many other types of monomers, or they can be used to uh, synthesize polyurethanes, as we know. And the polyurethanes can have a wide range of biobased content, depending, of course, on the biobased content of the, oil, of the 
polyol. Uh, the isocyanate up to now is only derived from oil feed stock, of course. Another <laughs> interesting uh, uh, field, totally different from the ones we touched up to now, is that of rubbers. Bio-based rubbers, not only natural rubber, but I said the remaining, more than 50%, derives from oil. What can be done? Bioisoprene, it has been shown that the genetically modified microorganisms can grow on several uh, substrates and produce isoprene gas. And this isoprene gas can be polymerized into polyisoprene, of course. So, uh, bio-based rubbers, uh, there are several very important tire uh, companies, Goodyear, Michelin, Bridgestone, that are uh, in the business of obtaining bioisoprene and using it in, their, in the production of their tires. Uh, an Italian company, Universalis with Genomatica, are interested in the biobutadine, another type of monomer. Givo, that we already saw the, uh, being involved in the business of terephthalic acid, together with Lanxess, is interested <coughs> in a number of different uh, bio-based rubber com compounds using different types of monomers. So also this one is an important field of applications. I cannot uh, end without uh, mentioning at least a couple of more monomers. Uh, we found information uh, two, three years ago, but these informations have not been updated in the web. So we cannot understand whether these ideas went on or whether the economical crisis stopped uh, the uh, development of this. But uh, Braskem, the company in, uh, in South America interested in the production of uh, ethylene, also uh, launched a project on green polypropylene. The idea was, again, a partnership with Novozymes, etc. And the Solve in Dupa uh, was claiming uh, to build, they wanted the intention to build a, a plant uh, with capacity 120 kilotons per year of green PVC. And they announced it as PVC made from sugar and salt, salt from, uh, for, for the chlorine and sugar for, uh, of course, the ethylene. And before really closing this uh, overview of the different polymers and monomers, I must, of course, mention starch-based plastics. Uh, starch is not used as it is because you need to transform it into something that can be processed. So thermoplastic starch needs a number of different uh, processing steps, and it is often used not uh, on its own, but in conjunction in co um, together with other components. There are several companies uh, interested in this kind of business. Of course, we may mention Novamont in Italy, which is uh, one of the leaders in this field and is represented here today. And now let me try to go to conclusions. I'm trying not to keep it too long because I'm afraid you will be very tired. So let me try to conclude. Uh, this, uh, the subjects we touched today are uh, at the center of a very strong interest and a very intense debate. These are only three out of several reviews and feature articles that appear this year, 2013, on the topic. New, next generation renewable no monomers, opportunities for the next de decade for sustainable polymers, Green polymer chemist and bio-based plastics. Dreams and reality, you see, debate. So what is true and what is just a dream <coughs> around these, these things? This is something that, uh, uh, of course, uh, appeared in the scientific literature. But there is also a large interest from companies because this is a study from NOVA Institute that again appeared this year. And this is a forecast from the, this decade. What will happen in 2020? The forecast is that the production capacity will triple going from 2011 to 2020 on these polymers. And that the production will be mostly located in Asia and in South America. If we see the forecast, the analogous forecast by uh, European bioplastic, uh, apart from the fact that the numbers are not 
coincident, but you know, these things are always a little bit varying. But uh, the idea that uh, nowadays, uh, or a couple of years ago, the production was mainly in Asia and the South America, but uh, Europe and the US had a consistent share of the market. The idea is that here, if the projection is for 2016 instead of 2020, <coughs> as you see, Asia and South America have a very, very big share of that. And let's go back to where we started from. Bio-based means sustainable? This is a very difficult uh, question, and the answer is, again, very difficult. There are studies, for example, this is a result always from Nova Institute last year, 2012, where they compared, for example, greenhouse gas emissions of polymers like PLA and PHAs with petroleum-based polymers. And apparently, of course, they are much, much better from this point of view. However, among the various topics of the debate, one big problem is, are we in a conflict with food? Are we using food crops to produce plastics? Does it make sense in a world where millions of people are hungry? Uh, one of the big trends, and I will go to this in my last slide, is to find alternative feedstocks. So abandon food crops for alternative feedstocks. And this is something that, oh sorry, we already saw uh, uh, when we talked about the polylactic acid, if you remember. Another big problem is that in order to quantify or to, to give some numbers concerning sustainability, what is done usually is an LCA, a life cycle assessment. Life cycle assessment needs numbers and uh, it depends on the numbers that are available. So for these bio-based monomers and polymers, there are no data usually after the company gate. So the life cycle assessments that are available today are mostly cradle to gate, not cradle to grave. So um, to give a, a definitive answer to this question is very difficult nowadays. And uh, so let me go to my very last slide and uh, to tell you the trends. In my opinion, what are the trends nowadays? So the first and important trend is to synthesize traditional polymers using bio-based building blocks. Why traditional polymers? Because the production of traditional polymers has been already optimized towards environmental uh, impacts. It has been improved in many, many aspects. So one of the, of the things that uh, all the, the business around the uh, tereftalic acid uh, derives from this, of course, and uh, even polyethylene or whatever you like. So to use bio-based building blocks, so we save uh, oil resources and we contribute to an extra to the sustainability. But this is not the only trend, because another trend is to synthesize new polymers, new polymers with additional functionalities. And these functionalities come from the fact that the, the monomer is biosourced. There are some biosourced monomers that have specific functionalities that can be used while constructing uh, new macromolecules that will be used for some specific applications like health, agriculture, etc. An open problem is the cost. So another trend and important thing is to optimize the production of bio-based polymers aimed at a drastic cost reduction. Perhaps this will also come together with the scale up of the processes. Although scaling up uh, biotechnological processes is not always such uh, a straightforward thing. And last but not least is the innovation on the feedstocks. I already mentioned it and I want to stress it. So no more food competing feedstocks, but also feedstocks that can have a secondary benefit. So for example, in arid and abandoned lands, it is possible to grow uncommon non-food crops <laughs> like some grasses or something that are very resistant and so they can be feedstock for microbes for the fermentation processes and also contribute to land recovery. The same thing regards the use of waste. 
So the use of waste, food waste or agricultural waste. And so you get, again, a feedstock for microbes and you valorize the waste, you avoid the costs of waste management. And with this, I would like to thank everybody and uh, if uh, I may answer your questions, I will be happy. Thank you.